أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله صلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We're going to start chapter 5 إن شاء الله There is a test on chapter 5 by itself and since it's just on one chapter if you focus and you study well then you can do well in that because it does not have a lot of material and we're going to have that right after this spring break inshallah okay all right so we have this chapter is about computer fraud um, there are four types of threats accounting information system threats that a company could face the first one is natural and political disasters like earthquake or war or things like that the second one is software errors and equipment malfunction so the software not working properly, the equipment not working properly. Uh, this is again unintentional. We don't know. We don't. Uh, this is not done by someone intentionally. The third one are unintentional acts done by individuals. For example, accidentally deleting something or misplacing something or you know forgetting to 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 do something. So these are unintentional acts. The fourth one are the intentional acts when somebody is trying to intentionally do some harm and the computer IT system is involved. So this is what this chapter is primarily about. But we're going to get into this chapter and introduce ourselves to generally what we mean by fraud first and then we go, go into specific computer crimes, computer frauds, etc. Fraud is any and all means a person uses to gain an unfair advantage over another person so something that is not deserving something that someone does not deserve they're trying to get it and in the process harming someone else generally it could be a false statement a lie about a material fact material fact means something that matters something that is significant something if someone were to trust you and act right they would be harmed and this material fact false statement about the material fact is made knowingly meaning when this lie is spoken when the person is speaking this lie that person knows that this is not the truth if you speak about something if you make a statement about something and in your statement when you're making that statement you think that this is the truth right then that is not fraud. You may be proven wrong later. Later on, may, you might find that you were wrong, but you did not know when you spoke at that time. So when you make a false statement and you know this is the lie, that is fraud. So a victim relies on the statement, right? Someone, the victim is the person who's harmed, trusts the statement, and then suffer a loss. So let's say an investment advisor gives an advice to buy a particular stock of a company and he knows or she knows that that stock is a bad stock the company will be going out of business and the investor will lose money and the investor trusts the advice of the advisor and purchases the stock and suffers loss so this would be considered a fraud okay now you can stop and ask me questions uh, you know, I, I'm going to continue inshallah because most of this is not very difficult to understand. There are two types of frauds for our purposes the occupational fraud and everything else. Now, we are primarily going to focus on the three categories of occupational fraud that we have. The first one is fraudulent statement. The second one is asset misappropriation and the third one is bribery and corruption. We're going to talk about every single one of them with examples and details. There are others that are not in the occupational fraud, right? Uh, such as intellectual property theft, healthcare fraud, tax fraud, and a comprehensive list of this is in your textbook. You can go and find it. We're not going to put a lot of focus on this these types of frauds intellectual property or healthcare or tax fraud okay our primary focus is going to be on these three types so let's start the first one occupational frauds right mm. they have three categories 
The first category is fraudulent statements, making fraud statements. The fraud statements could be about something that is financial in nature or something that is non-financial in nature. So for example, you could give out information to the public about false profits and losses and assets and liabilities. Those are financial. You could give false information about non-financial, for example, launching of a new product or uh, the trustworthiness of a particular medicine, etc., etc., while you know that those things are not true. The second, asset misappropriation. Misappropriation means putting something where it does not belong, right? So in asset, asset misappropriation means taking the company assets and using it either for your advantage or giving it to someone who does not deserve. It could involve cash. It could involve disbursements. Disbursements means payments. So you could write checks to people. Uh, inventory, using the company inventory for personal use or giving it to people who do not deserve to get that and other uh, types of asset misappropriation. The third category is bribery and corruption. Bribery is rishwa. Bribery is giving somebody a gift or money to gain an unfair advantage. And corruption is any type of illegal or unethical action. And we're going to talk about many examples. A uh, few examples are here on this slide. For example, illegal gratuity. Illegal gratuity means giving somebody a gift or a, 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 an amount of cash to get something in your favor. So let's say you give, you pay somebody in the government, you pay somebody uh, in, in another company to get their business that is not allowed to be paid. Economic extortion means uh, economic pressure. So you could put economic pressure on your junior accountant to make false entries and you can thread them with the loss of job or lack of promotion, etc., etc. So you could put economic pressure on someone. Conflict of interest is where you have two different interests and they cannot be satisfied at the same time. So for example, let's say you are uh, trying to choose a supplier uh, to buy the goods from and as your uh, company's agent your primary goal is to find the best supplier but among the suppliers who, who provide the, the particular item one is your cousin or your brother and you also want that cousin or the brother to get the business so now there's conflict of interest because you want to help your cousin you also want the best product for the company. So in situations like this, it is best to excuse yourself from that role. Now, reality is far from that, but the conflict of interest is where you have two different interests and uh, rarely can both of them, them be satisfied. I'll give you another example. For, for instance, if my daughter was in this class, you know, I would like for every student to get a fair grade, but I would also like for my daughter to get an A. So, you know, even if my daughter earned an A in my class, it would look just odd. So I would have to excuse myself from teaching this class during the semester when my daughter is taking this class. Does that make sense? Right? So this is conflict of interest. It should be avoided at all costs. The next one is kickback. Kickback is when the supplier makes a payment to the agent who's supposed to select the supplier uh, in the hope that the supplier would be selected. So let's say you have an agent who's trying to select the best supplier to, to sell the product to, uh, to, to buy the product from. So let's say there is a, there is a person in Qatar University who's given the responsibility to, to select the best computer seller and buy the computers from them. Well, if one of the computer suppliers says that, you know, if you buy from us, every time Qatar University buys a computer, we'll give you 50 rials. So this is called kickback, right? This agent who's supposed to select the best supplier is getting an illegal amount from the supplier. This is called kickback. Is that clear? Is kickback clear? 
very good now the process of the fraud right the process of the fraud the perpetrator is the person who does the fraud uh, perceives a need now you know there's a difference between a need and a want you know we say often say I need I need I need but it's actually I want right so you need food but you want a particular type of food you need transportation but you want a particular type of car you need a watch to, to uh, stay up to date with time but you want a particular brand right so the person who's going to do the fraud has a perceived need meaning he feels or she feels that there is a need but it's actually not a need right the person starts working for a company and gains trust right works hard and is given trust more and more trust with important roles and the person uses deception meaning they are showing something but there's something else going on in the background and they start to steal from the company because they're given the trust and eventually once the person is doing this the first time the second time and not getting caught the person becomes careless and confident that you know there is nobody can catch me I will continue to do this and then the money that is stolen usually is spent very quickly because this is haram money this is money that the person has uh, earned easily and without any effort and illegally so the money gets spent there is no baraka there is no blessing in the in the money and eventually the amount is so much right the amount the person has taken is so much that they get caught right so the person is caught uh, and the primary reason is the absence or override of internal controls the primary reason of the fraud is the absence or override of internal controls absence of internal control we discussed internal control if you remember the purpose of internal control how many purposes did we say the internal control has three right what is the first one Preparation of true and fair financial statements. Very good. What is the second one? Having effective and efficient operations. Very good. What is the third one? compliance with regulations very good so there are certain pr procedures put in place to ensure these three things and when these controls are absent or they are overridden meaning the control is there but nobody follows it right then it is easier to do the fraud it makes it easier to do the fraud okay so the first category we're going to talk about here is the financial statement fraud because that is primarily what we are concerned about as accountants it is an intentional or reckless conduct by adding by adding or omitting uh, resulting in materially misstated financial statements meaning you show something more than what it, it, it the reality is for example adding more to profit added more adding more to income adding more to asset or omitting something hiding the loss hiding the uh, liability any bad elements you're hiding any good element you're increasing without actually having more income or more sales etc intentionally right not making my mistake but intentionally and the reason for doing this is number one to deceive investors and creditors those people who are going to loan lend money to the company the creditors or the investors who are going to buy stocks the financial statements when they look better than the reality the investors and the creditors would be attracted to that increasing the stock price so better financial statements generate better stock prices meeting cash flow needs right generating 
if you cannot generate cash flows then you can at least show it on the financial statement by lying on the financial statement that you do have the cash flow hide company losses and problems right these are the reasons why financial statement fraud is done undetected frauds lead to half of the lawsuits against the external auditor so when you come in as an auditor and if you cannot find the fraud now auditors primary job is not to hunt for frauds you're not actively looking for fraud you're actively looking at the financial statement to see whether they are true and fair and then expressing an opinion on that but in the process you keep an eye open to see if you smell any fraud if the fraud is there and it's not detected later on there may be a court case against the auditor the way the auditor can protect himself or herself is by doing the audit procedure properly so if they do the audit procedure properly and they document what they have done and I have you have heard me say document 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 in auditing two class right anyone here who heard me say it is very important to document anyone here anyone in the class right now who has heard me say it is very important to document right it's very important to document so if you document what you have done and you're in a court case and you can prove that you did everything that you were supposed to do and still the client was able to hide the fraud from you then the judge will let you grow go you don't have to worry about the case against you but if you did not do or you don't have enough evidence to show that you went through the steps and you decided based on your good judgment and the proper knowledge and training that you had then if you can prove that then there is no problem okay now there are some common approaches to the financial statement fraud the first one is recording fictitious revenues meaning recording sales that actually did not happen okay the client could do that because the company uh, who's doing fraud could do that recording revenues prematurely so recording the sales before it actually happens now let me see who remembers when do you record the sale there is a particular activity a particular document that must be present before you record the sale let me see who can who can remember that from auditing to when can you record the sale at what point do you record the sale anyone and the sales order and you have the shipping document and then you have the invoice which one of these which one of these you must you have before you record the sale you must ship very good when you ship the goods so there must be a shipping document which is dated either on the day of the recording of the sale or a day before the date of the sale that was recorded okay so the shipping document very good Rahaf. excellent okay number three uh, recording expenses in a later period so expenses must be recorded as soon as they happen this is called conservatism in the field of accounting that revenues are recognized when they are earned revenues are recorded when they are earned and expenses are recognized or recorded when they incur so immediately after it incurs and not later so an expense for February should not be recorded in March it should not be recorded in April it should be recorded in the same period number four overstating inventories or fixed assets so whatever the value of the inventory is it's reported on the financial statement is it, what's reported on the financial statement is more same with the fixed assets right you have a, a building that is 50 years old and on the balance sheet the value of it is much higher than what it would be if you were to sell it right the depreciation is miscalculated the asset is misrepresented misrepresented in the financial statements number five concealing losses and liabilities so not all accounts payables or notes payables are recorded properly not all losses are reported timely so all of these things are methods of 
financial statement fraud okay any questions are you following okay what can you do to prevent these frauds number one ethical tone at the top what does it mean ethical tone at the top tone at the top means uh, you know the higher management of the company like the CEO CFO and people like those they have a high ethical standard for themselves they are personally ethical and they send the message that you know unethical activities are not going to be tolerated and all the people in the company know that the CEO is very honest he never steals from the company the CFO is very honest the top management are very honest and they care about us and they care about the company so if this message is sent then the people below them also become very uh, cautious about not doing anything wrong not doing anything fraud but if the top is dishonest everybody knows the CEO is a thief the CFO is a thief then when these people below them are stealing the people below them are stealing they think that we are just stealing from another thief so what's the big deal so tone at the top is very important number two identify and understand factors leading to fraud so there are certain factors certain places where there is an opportunity to steal right identifying those places where the cash is handled or where inventories are moved from one location to another identify where those places are where where fraud can be done number three risk assessment so there are certain transactions there are certain uh, activities in the business that could be risky right and again this is a huge topic risk assessment is a huge topic but there are certain uh, elements of measurement of certain items are risky for example uh, measuring the inventory there is a method called lower of cost or market I don't know if you have heard of this uh, it should have been in your intermediate accounting class anybody heard of this lower of cost or market LCM an inventory cash calculation lower lower of cost or market so this is a particular place of calculating particular method of calculating the inventory and it could be risky sometimes because the inventory price may fluctuate tremendously like oil price and things like that so this again uh, is risk assessment on part of the company the company and the accountant knows that these are risky transactions risky measurements so they are aware of them number four designing and implementing internal control internal controls to prevent fraud so once the company understands that these are the places where fraud can happen these are the risky places where the calculation could go wrong they build some certain controls certain procedures certain proper calculations and reviews and uh, oversight by seniors to make sure that these places where fraud can happen or a risk is higher is managed with proper controls and procedures so that the possibility of fraud is minimized remember it is almost impossible and it is sad but it is almost impossible because the way human beings are it's almost impossible to completely avoid fraud right but the goal for any company is to reduce to minimize the fraud as much as possible okay are you following are you with me okay what is the auditor's responsibility the auditor's responsibility is first to understand fraud so we are discussing this so that you know what fraud is right to understand the fraud and then discuss the risk of material fraudulent misstatements so you discuss the auditors before they do the audit they discuss among themselves and they discuss with the management discuss with the management of the client the risk of the material fraudulent misstatements what is material material means something that matters something that is big something that would change the decisions makers decision 
if it would if it were to change right if the profit was so high or so low and if it were to change right it would make the decisions makers decision the auditor's job also is to obtain as much information as possible from the client and from outside parties before giving an opinion and the auditor's responsibility also is to identify assess and respond to the risks that the auditor identifies so when you go as an auditor there are certain procedures that you perform to make sure that you identify places where the the possibility of fraud is higher and you learn this in auditing one as well as in auditing two so if you're in auditing two we will uh, discuss this those who are in this the auditing too in this semester with me we are going through the details we started to talk about the details of the audit if you have been with me right in auditing too anyone completed auditing too with me in in a previous semester Tansi I know Tansi has done Noor who else completed auditing too with me how many anybody here doing auditing too with me this semester auditing too anyone registered okay very good so and if you haven't in auditing one is mandatory everybody has to go through auditing one auditing two is a is an optional course it's a, it's a elect it's an elective but I, I strongly encourage you to take it because the way the auditing two course is designed is it is going to make a very good accountant out of you inshallah a very good auditor out of you inshallah or prepare you to be an auditor let's put it that way not make an auditor out of you but prepare you to be an auditor uh, or, or an accountant as a matter of fact okay so the auditors uh, job is more you know detailed in those courses the auditors job also is to evaluate the results of the audit tests now this is something that you learn in detail when you gather data and then you test the sample and then uh, you come to the result of your statistical calculation to say to, to, to say whether the financial statement is true and fair or otherwise right and after this you communicate your findings to the management of the company right management of the client the AC stands for audit committee right audit audit committee so AC stands for audit committee audit committee is made up of individuals from the board of directors and there could be experts from outside as well the audit committee's job is to work with the auditors during the audit so the auditors communicate with the audit committee back and forth about the problems they're having the findings they're they're, they're finding etc etc so that the audit committee acting on behalf of the client could facilitate a smooth audit okay documenting the work very very important and every single detail you should document and I mentioned in the auditing class and I'll mention it here again you know I, I, I picked up you know sometimes I used to pick up a file that I was going to work with and as I looked at the first thing I looked at when I picked up a file a client file was what was done the previous year so I would look at the previous year's work and sometimes I would look at the work and I would see I would see something that would not please me I would I would think that who signed on this on this paperwork because this does not make any sense to me which accountant did that so I'd go to the back of the document and I would find my signature because I was the one who signed on that so I would go to the notes to read why did I do that and I would find a satisfactory explanation now remember this is my own work from a year ago that I do not remember until I read the notes so you cannot remember you're working on many many clients and you're working many hours you do not remember everything about every client impossible so if you document it will help you even the following year and just imagine if it was a different accountant right how much more the documentation is important so documenting the work is very very important document 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 every detail right and 
we would have uh, something called a data tracker where every single conversation with the client would be documented. So when I would be having a phone conversation, you know, I usually, usually have a headpiece and a, and a earphone with a microphone on. I'll be talking to the client on the phone and at the same time I would be typing in a software called data tracker where I would start uh, a new phone conversation file where I would select the topic of the conversation and then what I spoke to uh, what I spoke about and what the client would speak about and I would usually document every single detail so I would uh, document even personal details of the client for example if the client was stressed because uh, his child or her child was sick and so forth and the next time we would, when I would talk to the client I would look at my conversation the previous conversation so I would ask the client for example I would look at the conversation I would ask the client has your child recovered is is your child okay now is he healthy now and the client would be very you know surprised that you know how you remember so you know I never told the clients that I looked at the previous documented phone conversation I would just smile and I'd say you know I try <laughs> things like that so again this is a uh, personal touch that you can provide the, the clients it's necessary customer service is definitely a very good thing to have right uh, and customer service is tremendously hacking uh, in many places uh, so it's good to do provide the extra care uh, incorporate a technology focus uh, you will find if you work as an accountant or an auditor that you will learn a lot about technology. You will work with technology a lot. You will learn many softwares. And we're going to start, we're going to do an a, a ERP in this course where you are going to record transactions and produce reports using uh, an, an enterprise resource planning software, which will be after the break, inshallah, after the spring break. Um, so, uh, there is definitely a lot of technology focus when you are uh, an accountant. So let me see before we talk about this last slide for the today for the day. Uh, are you ready for the spring break? That is the question, right? Let me see. Are you ready for the spring break? Let me see yes or no. I cannot believe it. I'm having some no responses. Go ahead, go ahead. Respond to this question. Are you ready for the spring break? Answer the poll. There's a poll. When is the spring break? Does anybody know? You don't know when the spring break is, Noor? Come on. Starts. Officially starts officially starts on the 14th of March, but you can start it on the 12th of March because 12th of March is Friday. So last class before spring break is 11. So three more weeks after this week. The spring break is a little bit late this year. I don't know why. Anyhow, look at this. Two students say they are not ready. Eight students say they're ready. And 11 students are logged in, but they are not listening. So... Here we have the last slide for the day. Who does the fraud and why do they do the fraud? Uh, research of psychological and demographics find that there is a big difference between the violent criminals and the white collar criminals. The violent criminals are your you know, murderers and thieves and so forth that they go and do crimes. Uh, and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Qatar is 
Does anybody know Qatar's ranking on being a safe city in the world? What, where Qatar is ranked? Doha is ranked. Do you know? Ranking in the ranking of safest cities in the world. Where is Qatar? Do you know? Where is Doha? Do you know? Anybody knows? Anybody knows? No one knows? Qatar is number two. Doha is number two. Number two. Number two. Okay. Who's number one? Anybody know? Abu Dhabi is number one. Okay. Uh, and also there are some other cities in, in UAE that are in that list. So Alhamdulillah, we are blessed. It's an emma to be living here. This is one of the top safest cities, number two in the world, right? To be living in so you can live very very peacefully peace is what people want uh, there is a big difference between the violent criminals and the white collar criminals white collar criminals are those people who are sitting in offices wearing suit and tie and stealing money right through making journal entries and through making bank transfers things like that so there is a big difference between those violent criminals and the white collar criminals but there is not a big difference you cannot see visual differences between the white collar criminals and the general public who's not going to do the crime. For example, the accountant who's going to do the fraud and the accountant who's not going to do the fraud, both may be religious, both are definitely educated, both may be coming from very good family backgrounds. So you don't know who's going to or who's not going to do the fraud, right? Uh, they may be unhappy employees seeking revenge, right? They may be educated and they may have ha had a good career, but somehow they're unhappy with their company, unhappy with their boss, and they want to do something bad to the company. These people are usually ideal, hardworking employees in positions of trust. Obviously, they have to be in a position of trust, in a, pos in a high position, and they did not just get there without hard work. So it took them hard work to get there, and they don't have any prior criminal records, right? So those, all those Wall Street bankers and, and lawyers and so forth who did the, 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 the ethical, unethical things that are in jail, they did not have any previous criminal records, right? And somehow, some of these people may be interested in a challenge. So they're not angry, they're not uh, greedy maybe, but they just want to see whether they can do this and get away with it not get caught and again this is the type of sickness that people have so these are reasons uh, why people could do the fraud uh, while you may not know that it is possible for such a person because they are educated coming from good family backgrounds maybe even religious right maybe praying five times a day and so forth but somehow there is something wrong in in their heart or some problem going on which causes them to do the fraud right so we will stop here inshallah we do have a few minutes left but there is the next topic is uh, something that i would like to discuss all together the fraud triangle and so forth and we'll start from there on sunday okay do you have any questions so far what we have discussed any questions on it okay all right very good have a very good weekend inshallah and i will see you on sunday i'm working on grading the exams inshallah so hopefully sometime next week i will uh be finished with the grading inshallah because the grading is a side thing everything else is also going the classes and other midterms all of that is going simultaneously so i'm grading a few papers every day and i'm making sure that you know i read your answers and i understand whether you wrote something that is not quite complete but you do understand so i'm reading them carefully and inshallah by Sometime next week, inshallah, I will finish grading. All right? I will see you in this class on Sunday, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.